about yesterday was we had our annual church picnic, and uh, what a wonderful time we had, wasn't it? Glorious. And I uh, just want to take an opportunity to thank the men of S.H.I.E.L.D. and all those that worked and volunteered. It's a beautiful, beautiful day. It really was wonderful. And uh, just so thankful for what God is doing. I, I don't know about you, but um, I was disturbed to find out last night that there had been another mass shooting uh, down in Texas, El Paso. And then this morning I turned on the television and then there was another one in Dayton, Ohio. And I don't know about you, but I'm disturbed by it all. It breaks my heart. It's entirely unnecessary. I don't have solutions. Even if I did, I don't know if anybody would want to listen. Uh, but I do know that during this time, no matter where you stand on gun control, where you stand politically, there are people's hearts that are broken today in an unexpected way. And so I want us to join together and pray for the people that were affected by these two mass shootings. And I want us to pray uh, that our Congress and Senate and President will have the political will and wisdom to do something about this very real problem uh, that we're experiencing in our country. Uh, would you join me in prayer this morning for that? Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We know, God, that you are a God that heals every heart. That, Lord, that you know how to wipe away every tear. Lord, there are broken people this morning that's li whose lives have been affected by violence. I pray today, God, that somehow, some way, that you would touch their hearts and heal them. Lord, let them not be angry with you, but let them run to you, Lord, knowing that they can abide under the shadow of the Almighty and find everything that they need. Lord, we pray today for our Senate and our Congress, our President, and we pray, God, that you would speak to them, give them the wisdom and the courage to do something about this problem that's affecting our society. We pray, God, that you would give them wisdom, boldness, and strength to be able to lead through all the special interests and all the complexities that, Lord, that they would be able to get to the root of the issue so that way our nation would be healed again. We know, God, that according to your word of your people who are called by your name will humble themselves and fast and pray and seek your face, turn from our wicked way that you would heal their land. So, God, today we stand on behalf of this nation, and we ask, God, that you would heal our land. I know there are many that have different ideas of what healing could look like, but we know, God, that you are the great architect of what healing really is. And we pray, God, that your plan, your design for a nation, for a community, for a people, Lord, let that be the guiding light. We pray today, God, as we gather as your people, that we would continue to stand in the gap. Now, Lord, we turn our attention to your word. We thank you, God, that your word gives life and light to each and every person that hears it, examines it. We pray today, God, as we turn our attention to you, that, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, who is in this place, the great teacher, the great illuminator, the great encourager, the great guide upon our lives and in our lives, Lord, that you would open up the Scriptures this morning to us, Lord, that we might know what it means to walk with you. We thank you for this, Lord. And we give you the praise and the honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Uh, some years ago, National Geographic, the magazine, published an amazing article on the power of light. The article began this way, light reveals the world to us. Body and soul crave it. Light sets our biological clocks. It triggers in our brains the sensation of color. 
Light feeds us, supplying the energy of plants to grow. It inspires us with special effects like rainbows and sunsets. Light gives us life-changing tools from incandescent bulbs to lasers and fiber optics. You know, scientists have discovered over the years that light travels approximately or over 186,000 miles per second. And without uh, the sun and its ability to heat and light our planet, life as we know it would not exist. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Then God said, Let there be light. And there was. In the same way God commanded the sun into existence to bring light into the world, he also commanded his son Jesus Christ to bring the light of salvation into the world. John chapter 12, verse 36 says, While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of the light. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you might become sons of the light. What a profound statement that Jesus makes. Recently in our region, we experienced a severe weather storm. We, we experienced a major windstorm in our region, and many, including Christ Church, were without power for days. And I remember when I was young, we would get excited about power outages. You know, there wasn't much on television. You had three channels on U uh, VHF and three channels on UHF, and, 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 and it gave you an opportunity to play board games. And, and when we were young and we had a power outage, we would light candles. We didn't really have flashlights. We would light candles, and as a result of lighting those candles, we would be able to uh, uh, see in our home. You can light thousands of candles with the flame of one single candle. Thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands. In fact, if you had enough fuel, you could light millions of candles all from one candle. The interesting part of this illustration is that the flame of the original candle is never diminished, no matter how many times it's used to light additional candles. It retains its value. It retains everything that it is comprised of. And so no, uh, no matter what, the value of the flame is never diminished by its reproduction. And that's what Jesus compares himself. He compares himself to a fire or a flame that burns in the world. Though no matter how many times it's reproduced, the reproduction never decreases its value. When I was young, I liked to collect coins, and I realized that some coins, no matter what their value are, have different grades and different values to them. If you collect coins or baseball cards, you can have 100 baseball cards of a particular player that are available, but then, depending upon the grade of that card, it will determine the value of it. Recently, they sold some baseball cards at an auction worth millions of dollars, like a shoeless Joe Jackson, Joe, uh, uh, Jackson uh, a baseball card, right? They, they're worth millions of dollars, all because of the value that's assigned to it. When, when, when I was young, when we opened up the baseball cards, we threw them around. But some of those have great value. Now, there could be two of them that are equally identical except for the condition that they're in, one valued at millions and one valued at nothing. Same thing with coins. You could take a coin from the 1800s. One is in pristine, uncirculated condition. Its value is thousands of dollars. Another one of the same year that's been diminished in its quality is worth hardly anything. But when Jesus comes into the world, he comes into the world as a bright light to us. And no matter how many times the power of Jesus Christ is duplicated in the lives of the people of this world, his value is never diminished. This morning, I want to share with you a message that I've entitled, Jesus is the light of the world. If you have your Bibles with you, if you would please join me in John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus is the light of the world. As I was preparing for this message, that little song began to ring in my heart. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I'm going to let it shine. I didn't realize that that song was one that was really built around the civil rights movement. It was first uh, written in the 1920s, and then during the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, it became to become real popular, and all of a sudden it came into the mainstream. But the truth of the message of that song speaks to each and every one of us. This little light of mine, 
I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. John chapter 8, verse 12, it reads this way. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus makes it very clear. Some theologians and historians believe that his statement may have been sometime around the festival of lights in the temple. And as they were lighting these candlesticks in the temple and in the courts of the yard during the festival of lights, here comes Jesus now into that community, into that area, and declares that though you're lighting these candles, that he is the light of the world. Jesus gives us a greater revelation of who he is by using commonplace things like bread, light, and water to symbolize himself. He uses the ordinary to speak of the extraordinary, the physical to speak of the spiritual, the temporal to speak of the eternal, the here and now to speak of the hereafter, the earthly to speak of the heavenly, the limited to speak of the unlimited, and the finite to speak of the infinite. Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 35, that he is the bread of life. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 10, verse 9, I am the door. In John chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. In John chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And John chapter 15, verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. You see, Jesus gives us a greater revelation of who he is when he tells us that he is bread, he is water, he is life, and that he is also light. And as a result, we understand that not only is God self-existing, but that he also meets our every need. Isn't that good? God meets our every need. And as Jesus uses these natural illustrations, he then makes a statement that he is the light of the world. In essence, what Jesus was saying is that he is absolute in his holiness and in his justice. And just as the physical sun comes into the world to provide light and heat for the world, so does Jesus come to provide a spiritual light in order that salvation may come into the world and that we could be transformed by it. You see, it's impossible to have a world as we know it today without the physical sun. That sun gives us everything that we need in order for creation to maintain itself. And in the same way our world would not exist the way that we know it without the physical sun, Jesus comes and says the world would not exist in a spiritual capacity without his coming into the world. Jesus is the light of the world. And no matter how much darkness is in the world, no matter what we're going through, Jesus is the light of the world. I realize there are a lot of people having debates now about, about being self-satisfied and self-contentment and self-fulfillment. You can go through uh, the bookstore and the racks uh, on, on magazines and books talking about how to have a more fulfilled life, how to have a more satisfied life. But the truth is nothing in this world can satisfy us like Jesus Christ. Nothing. A new car won't satisfy you for long. A new husband or a wife won't satisfy you for long. I know some of us think, man, my problem is my spouse. Man, if I could just get a new spouse, everything would be okay. Listen, you're going, wherever you go, there you are. And you're going to bring the same problems with you that you have had now and before into what is in the future. Listen, unless we change, nothing will change around us. Jesus is the one thing in this life that is solid and sure. Jesus is one thing in this life that can bring about a, a satisfaction in our lives that nothing else can. It doesn't matter what kind of car you have, where, where, where your home is located at, how much education you have. We all have the same basic need, and that is to have the great big gaping hole in our lives filled with something, and it can only be filled through Jesus. Drugs can't do it. Alcohol can't do it. Sex can't do it. It. None of these things that this world tells us can do it, can do it. They all leave us wanting. Jesus meets a woman at a well in John chapter 4. He says, if you give me the water that you drink from, you know what? Uh, I'm going to be thirsty again. Because it doesn't satisfy. 
He said, but woman, if you drink the water of life that comes from me, you will drink it and you will never be thirsty again. Can somebody say amen to that? You see, there's contrast between light and darkness all throughout the scriptures and our text this morning. Light is one of the most complicated things as well as the most essential things for us. Let me ask you a question. Is light the absence of darkness or is darkness the absence of light? John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines into the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. You see, Jesus is the Word, and the Bible tells us in John chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men. You see, we shine because of Jesus Christ. This world is held in, in, in form because of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that all things were made for him and by him and held together through him. If you ask me, Jesus and the Holy Spirit in the world is the only thing that's holding off the, 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 the unleashing of evil in our society. I want you to join me in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 8 through 14. Jesus is the light of the world. All this month we're talking about how God has brought light into our lives and how that life is supposed to, the light is supposed to affect us and change us. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 14. It says, for you, talking about us. Look at somebody and say you. Come on, look at somebody else and say me. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, for you were formerly darkness. Formerly. Formerly. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth trying. Man, how many of us are trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord? Isn't that good? Man, I'm just like Paul. I'm trying, doing my best, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Verse 11, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret, but all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason, it says, awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. I love the way the text tells us that we were formerly a certain way. Our lives, as a result of sin, the Bible compares us to darkness. It compares us to a life apart from God, a life that was self-centered and, try, you know, trying to find things that would bring about satisfaction in, in, in our lives. But the truth is, those things never last. We were once in darkness, but Jesus then comes into our lives, and as a result of Jesus Christ, our lives are different. You see, the greatest way that the spiritual light of Christ affects you is through salvation and then spiritual transformation. As a result, a New Testament believer should experience change through the power of the Holy Spirit. We should live in the world but not be of the world. Something powerful should be happening in your life every day. Come on. Something powerful should be happening in your life every day, not just on Sunday. Not just when you walk through the church. You have been transformed. You were once blind, but now you see. You were once lost, but now you have been found. You once were broken, but now you are healed. You were once a child of darkness, but now you are a child of light as a result of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And as a result of that, something powerful, something powerful should happen in your life every day. Every day, God is, is, is in you, he's on you, he's living through you. Something powerful should be happening in your life every day. And if it's not happening in your life every day, we have to stop and take inventory and say, why is it? Perhaps Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 14, is that we're trying to live with one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God. And it doesn't work. 
It doesn't work. You could try to, to split that line. You could try to ride that rail. You could try to live on the edge of that thing. Uh, but like Johnny Cash uh, said, you know, you, 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 can't, you can't walk that line. You can't walk that. You can't live on that line because what happens is God wants to pour out his grace upon you because he's made you a child of light. But as a result of us trying to live in darkness as well, they're not, they're not compatible to one another. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's not compatible. It's not compatible. Something powerful should be happening in our lives as New Testament believers every day. Every day, not just on Sunday. You have to realize that you're a miracle. You're a miracle. You are a miracle. I look over this room, and I know there are people watching us by live stream. You are a miracle. You're, you're a miracle. You've broken the cycle of poverty in your life. You've broken the cycle of sickness in your life. The generational curses have been broken. You've broken the cycle of divorce in your life and over your family. You are a miracle. You're a living miracle. Something powerful should be happening in your life because of that. You're the first one to go to college. You're the first one to get your master's degree. You're the first doctor in your family. You're the first one. Something is powerful. Something powerful is happening in your life. And unfortunately, what happens is we compare our, 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 our lowest points with other people's highest points. I heard, I heard a person say it this way. They said, you, you, you compare your bloopers with somebody else's highlight reel. And as a result of that, we start to get discouraged in our life thinking that we're not grown. But, but the truth is, you're a miracle. You're an overcomer, and you are victorious in your life. Can somebody shout amen? That's who you are. Look at the, look at the cycles that have been broken. Look at what's happening. You say, but pastor, I'm still struggling. I still have things. Listen, that's why the scripture says trying. Verse 10, Ephesians chapter 5, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Now, Paul wrote that. Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Paul wrote that under the power and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We're trying to figure it out. But instead of, I've learned something recently. Instead of trying to hold on so tight to Jesus, loosen your grip and allow him to hold tightly onto you. Loosen your grip and allow his grip to get stronger on your life. Allow his grip to grab a hold of you and lead you and guide you because when you're holding on tight and you make a mistake, you beat yourself up, you get discouraged and you figure, you know what, I ate that donut, I might as well eat the whole box. I'll start again tomorrow. When's Monday start? I'll start Monday. I don't blew it. I messed up. I might as well just enjoy myself now. Break out the Reese cups and Kit Kat bars. But as you loosen your grip on him, allow him to hold you tighter, and you'll find a new level of grace to be able to live this life with your spirituality and your, human and your humanity together glorifying God through your life. I want you to turn to this text this morning. I read this, and it just it, it transformed me. It, it blew me away. Uh, I was just going to have you listen to it, but I want you to turn to it. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And I'm going to share a little bit on it. What I'd really love for you to do this week is to take this text home and dive into it. Dive into it. I really want you to grab a hold of this, because if you could get this text, it will transform your life. And, uh, and, I, and I know the power of the Holy Spirit is all about transforming our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. Now, I've read that text many times. Came to Christ when I was 18. I'm 51. Been in ministry for over 25 years. I've read that text over and over. I've read past that text over and over. But as I was studying for this morning's message, I began to look at this text in a new way. But we all, with unveiled face, 
beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. If you rewind the story and go back thousands of years, you hit the rewind button, we get to a place in, in, in the Bible where Moses is called by God. And as a result of Moses being called by God, he's called to lead the children of Israel out of bondage, out of Egypt. We all have seen the movie, whether it was a Disney movie or a C.C. Uh, uh, DeMille's uh, a movie, The Ten Commandments. We, we have all, Cecil B. DeMille's uh, uh, a movie, we've all seen the Ten Commandments, the plagues, and eventually them being led out of Egypt. As a result of that, they wander through the desert for a period of time. And, and, and prior to that, though, or, or during that period of time, they come up to Mount Sinai. And as tradition would have it, Moses looks up and he sees a glowing cloud on the mountain and then travels up that mountain. God gives Moses the Ten Commandments, or as many have called it, the law uh, of Moses. Now, the law of Moses is Ten Commandments. Moses, he, he, he gets the, the commandments. You know, we all remember the lightning coming and writing it on the stone tablets. Moses grabs it. He goes up one way. He comes down an entirely different way. When he comes down with the, with the commandments, all of a sudden people look at Moses, and it says in the Scripture, in the text, that his face glowed like the sun. It shined like the sun. And so as a result of that, Moses had to wear a veil. Because as a result of that, they would not be able to stand in Moses' presence because he shined with the glory of God on his life. Could you imagine that? Sometimes I come out of church feeling like I'm shining so much. Shining so much for the presence of God. And that's how Moses was. He came down and he shined so much that they had to, he had to put a veil over his face. And so now Paul begins to talk about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all with unveiled faces. You see, every time uh, that, that the law of Moses was read, there was a veil not only over Moses' face, but there was also a veil over the law. And so the law lacked the transformative power to be able to move people from darkness into light. What the law did was simply told people what was wrong. It brought condemnation. It did not bring life. And so prior to verse 18, Paul begins to explain to us that not only was a veil over Moses' face, a veil was also over the law. As a result of the veil, the transformative ability of the law was non-existent. It brought death rather than life. It didn't change them. It only condemned them. Jesus says if you failed in one area of the law, you failed over all of it. When Jesus came, though, who is the living word, the Bible tells us the veil was removed. And a new dispensation of grace and revelation was poured out upon the earth. Verse 18, but we all with unveiled faces. No longer are our faces veiled. No longer is God's word veiled to us. But now we have been unveiled. Now we have the ability to be changed by the word. So the word of God is now unveiled because of what Jesus did on the cross. And as a result, we can behold as in a mirror the glory of God. Behold as in a mirror the glory of God. What do you see when you look in the mirror? What do you see? Recently, somebody did an experiment where they brought people out of the crowd and they held up a mirror and they asked them what they saw. And, and people's response was surprising to me, uh, but, but, but in, a, in a way, I, I understand. They looked and they said, discouraged, depressed, a failure, a nobody, a loser. And all of a sudden now, as their reflection was shining in a mirror, they saw every negative thing that was in their lives. But the, the text begins to tell us that the word of God is now unveiled to us, and as a result, we can behold as in a mirror the glory of God. 
the glory of God. So when I look in the mirror as a result of the transforming power of the Holy Spirit and the light of Christ in my life, as I look in the mirror, what happens is God's light shines into that mirror and as a result flecks back, reflects back onto my face and I'm being transformed by what I'm looking at. I'm being transformed by what I'm looking at. If you look at the world, you're being transformed into the world. If you look at, at, at the Bible, if you look at Jesus Christ, if you look at the Holy Spirit, you'll begin to get transformed by him because what you look at is what you are transformed into. And so he says, the veil has been removed. The power of God has been revealed through his word and through Jesus Christ. And now when you look at the word and allow the God that's on the inside of you to radiate out of you, you're being transformed because that's a reflection of God's glory. There's something to be said about positive confession. Confessing God's word over your life. I am the head and not the tail. Above and not beneath. I am victorious. I am a conqueror. I am healed. I am whole. There's something to be said about that because as you say it, you begin to believe it. So he tells us, he says, that we're being transformed because of the glory of God into the same image as Jesus Christ. That's, we're, we're being transformed into the same image as Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. And so the fact that Jesus is the light of the world, as I look into the mirror and allow the Christ that is on the inside of me to shine through me, I'm being transformed into the same glory. Being transformed into the same glory that Jesus Christ had as the light of the world. And so not only is Jesus Christ the light of the world, guess what? We are as well because we're being transformed by the same glory as we look gloriously into the image of God. How is it done? The Bible tells us. It tells us. It says in verse, at the bottom of verse 3 that we're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. From glory to glory. The picture that the text gives us, have you ever uh, gotten to a stream or a river and you have to cross it and you're looking for rocks that you can step on so you don't get wet? You know what I'm talking about, right? You're looking for rocks in the stream that you can leap onto and you don't get wet. And so the way that the text is showing this to us is that we're going from victory to victory. Not just glory to glory, not just church service to church service, but we're going from victory to victory. What we're doing is we're landing on a rock as there are waves and there is debris coming around us, victory. And then I'm leaping over to victory. And then I'm leaping over to victory. And as a result of my leaping over from victory to victory, I'm being transformed into the image of Christ because of his glory in my life radiating through me. Come on, shout Amen, somebody. I'm going from victory. Listen, it doesn't say from defeat to from defeat. It, it doesn't say that. The text doesn't say that, that, oh, we're discouraged going from defeat to defeat. We're, 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 we're being transformed by going victory to victory. Victory to victory. And as a result of moving from victory to victory, the transformative power of the Holy Spirit in our lives begins to change us. Looking at Jesus and allowing his glory to change you is the key to spiritual transformation, which in turn will cause you to burn brighter in our dark world. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, fixing our eyes on our problems. Fixing our eyes on our disappointments. Fixing our eyes on discouragement. Fixing our eyes on depression. Fixing our eyes on ourselves. You see, the devil wants you to concentrate on you. He does. He wants you to take your eyes off of Jesus and put them on you. It says here, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Victory to victory. 
Uh, Peter, Peter learned the hard way, didn't he? Peter, Peter learned the hard way. He, 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 he's there, and uh, he's in the boat with the disciples, and all of a sudden somebody says, it's a ghost. It's a ghost. And then Peter says, Jesus, is that you? Lord, if it's you, command me to come out of the boat and walk on the water with you. And so as a result, what happens? Peter gets out of the boat. Praise the Lord. Peter gets out of the boat. But what does Peter do? Peter starts to focus on his inadequacies as opposed to looking in the mirror and seeing the glory of God in his life. And so what happens to Peter? We know the story. Peter starts to sink. He starts to sink because what the devil wants to do is to cause you to focus in on your problems. God wants you to turn your focus away from your problems and put it on him, the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus, uh, Peter began to look around at the waves and everything that was going on, and all of a sudden, what does Jesus say? Look at me, Peter. Look at me. And what happened? Soon as Peter it was the same Peter. Peter. Peter was not transformed. It was the same Peter who just momentarily was sinking, but all he did was change his focus. He stopped looking at his life and the discouragement and disappointment in it and all of his problems, and he began to focus on Jesus. And as soon as he had turned his attention on Jesus, what happened? He started to come up out of that water again and began to walk on the water. And oftentimes we look at this one aspect of Peter and say, you know what, Peter, man, you really messed up. But I don't know, man. I don't know if I would have had the courage. It's dark out. It's stormy out, you know. And then there's something out on the water to say, Jesus, if it's you, command me to come out of the boat so I can walk on that water. But we're all Peter in some way, shape, or form, right? We all have highs and lows in our lives, and we're all on spiritual mountains at times and spiritual valleys at times. But the truth is, is that God wants us to take our attention off of ourselves, off of our problems, focusing our eyes on Jesus, so that way the light of the world can radiate through us. But in order for Jesus to radiate through you, he has to first radiate in you. He's got to radiate in you. That's why it says, come out from among them and be you separate. Be in the world, but not of the world. He learned. You see, spiritual transformation is the process by which Christ is formed in us for the glory of God, for the abundance of our own lives, and for the sake of others. Spiritual transformation in the lives of redeemed people is a testimony to the power of the gospel and its results. And it results in an increasing capacity to discern and do the will of God and to shine in a way that causes others to want to follow Jesus. That's what happens in, when we're transformed. The, 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 the thing that's on the inside of us, the, the spiritual life that's on the inside of us that's being suffocated by the darkness of the world begins to radiate out, begins to break out of that shell, and you begin to shine. And all of a sudden, listen, listen, sometimes all you have to do is be in the presence uh, around people, but if you'll shine enough, people will see the change in your life. You say, well, I'm not an evangelist. You don't have to be one. There's a, there's a practice called uh, the pr uh, presence evangelism. Presence evangelism says I walk into the room and the, the, the environment changes because of where I go, God is, and where God goes, I am. Because he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And so through, through your presence in a room, you can begin to radiate the light of Christ. Through a good deed, a kind gesture, a kind word to somebody, you can begin to radiate the light of Christ in a dark and broken world. And guess what? When you begin to do that, you'll begin to see how your light will begin to shine even brighter and brighter. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little, come on, can you help me sing? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. 
One more time. This little light. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Come on, let's put our hands together and thank the Lord for that. So how does it happen? It happens by allowing the Christ on the inside of you to radiate through you and around you, moving from victory to victory, victory to victory. As I keep my eyes focused on Jesus, the light of Jesus, which is on the inside of every believer, will overcome darkness and cause others to want to follow Jesus as well. You see, I want to challenge you this week, my friend, to allow the light of Christ to break forth in your life. Allow it to pour out of your heart and into a broken and hurting world as you keep your eyes focused on Jesus. You see, what the devil wants you to do is focus in on what you don't have. God wants you to focus in on what you do have. You may not have all the money that you need. You may not have all the friends that you need. You may not have all the resources that you need. But the greater one lives on the inside of the believer. If he is for us, who can be against us? Amen. Let's stand to our feet and give God a praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's sing that again, Robin.